Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Seth Jagger. Very honored to be here uh, presenting this webinar for EDGE. I hope everyone has found themselves safe in this rather hectic time in the world today. Let's get started. So once again, my name is Seth Jagger. I am the EDGE instructor for EDGE Machines at Stiles University. I teach on not only small machines, but large machines as well operations, uh, maintenance, so on and so forth, programming. Two of my co-presenters, I would like to welcome Lucia Morales, Edge Specialist in the Western Region, and Jeff Tolbert, uh, Product Specialist in the Northeast Region. Uh, if you two would, could you please uh, activate your mics and tell us a little bit about yourselves? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Hey, so my name is Jeff Tolbert. I work as the Edge Product Specialist for the Northeast. So uh, from the PA Ohio border all the way up to Maine is the, the territory I covered. I've been on the team here about two and a half years. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to getting this going today and helping out in any way I can. Great, Jeff. Thanks. Lucia? This is Lucia Morales talking to you from the other side of the country, I cover the West Coast for the edge processing products. I've been with the HOMA group for 11 years uh, since last week. and very proud working for Styles for five years. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Lucia. Jeff, would you mind speaking on uh, some of the common problems uh, maintenance related that you hear about uh, throughout your region? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So, and, you know, a couple of things that, that we touched on that will uh, more or less be a theme today is just speaking a lot of generalities. Everybody's in different situations. Everybody has different machines. Everybody's working with different conditions inside their own shops. And everybody has different product uh, that they're trying to get the most out of their edge bander with. But as a theme that of something that I see to to kind of go along with that thought is that uh, too many shops have a, a reactive approach to their edge bander rather than a proactive approach, mm -hmm. meaning that they'll, they'll wait for something to happen before they, before they, did, before they address it. And, you know, it's something that we're going to kind of go over a lot today is, you know, best practices to, you know, address things before they become a problem and before you have downtime. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind would be my suggestion is to just think of, uh, think of this as a really proactive approach to your edge bander and, and just your machines in general uh, that could really save you a lot of time and money over the long run. Excellent, excellent. Lucia, any input uh, from the West Coast? I would say the same thing. Some of the common questions are when, how frequently, to clean, to um, lubricate, to change tooling, and how to do it. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's get started, shall we? So preventative maintenance, uh, as Jeff had mentioned, if we can get ahead of the problems as far as maintenance is concerned, uh, we'll be a lot better off. So what is preventative maintenance? Maintenance uh, in the preventative aspect is, is working to be proactive instead of reactive, right? Uh, can it improve productivity, 25%, we can see that. Decrease maintenance costs by as much as 30% and definitely lengthen the machine life as much as 50%. So what does this all mean? Uh, this means a lot, uh, this means a cost savings as far as maintenance goes, right? Getting ahead of the curve. So what we're looking at here is a maintenance schedule. And this is a PM schedule developed by a customer and it was posted uh, right next to the edge bander. Now this isn't just any schedule, this is a schedule that's supplied to you in your machine manual. So inside the Edge Banner Machine Manual, there's this large schedule, and it uh, has different frequencies and tasks in which maintenance tasks should be performed. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down a little bit. I'm going to explain it to you, and we're going to go over some of the tasks. So let's take a look at it. So if I pull this maintenance schedule up and I look in the top upper left corner, I can see the oil dropper and I can see the different areas at the top of the page, basic machine, switch cabinet, AC gearing motor. And these are different components on the edge bander. And now on this, uh, this maintenance chart, I'm looking at the edge bander from front to back. So on this chart from left to right, I will, I'll be reading from the front of the machine to the back of the machine. Okay, 
Now down lower, I can actually see the individual tasks. So for example, for basic machine, I can note that it says to clean the entire machine and it has a green square uh, beside that of one. So what this is telling me is this is uh, to be done every single week. I'll see numbers listed on the side for every week in the year and 1.1 cleaning the machine that is to be done every single week. My recommendations, every single day, every single shift. The cleaner you can keep your machine, uh, the longer it's gonna last, and, the, and the, the better materials you're going to run through the edge banner. So as we look down through this maintenance chart, from left to right, remember, I can see joint trimming at the top, then I can see pressure zone, my spray device, my magazine device, my glue pot, different maintenance checks for those. Then I move from air tech, uh, compressed air maintenance, snipping unit maintenance, so on and so forth, all the way down throughout the edge banner. So what we're gonna be looking at today is a, a breakdown, so to say, of the different areas of the edge banders and the maintenance that needs to be done on those areas. So starting it out, uh, cleanliness is not only important on the inside of the edge banner, but on the outside as well. Okay, there are some components on the outside of the edge banner that play a pretty quit critical role. And as I open these doors up, we can see there's a lot of different areas, nooks and crannies, uh, pinch points, working points that need to be blown out. All right, the, the more these areas are blown out, the better they'll perform. And we can start up at front at the magazine area by removing our banding, removing our banding guide. And once I have the end feet out, I can then blow this area out. So as I blow here, I'm going to pay attention. I do not want to blow around this glue pot area. Okay, very critical. I want to blow away from this glue pot area. Why? I do not want dust in and around my glue pot. The more dust that I get into this glue roller, the more dust I get inside my glue pot, the more contaminants I have, and the less adhesion I have as far as applying the banding to the board edge and getting it to stick. So if I blow these areas out, making sure everything's good and clean, spiffed up, then I can look at incoming air. So at the very forefront of the edge banner, let's talk about incoming air. It's very important that the shop air coming into the edge banner uh, be moisture free. Okay, I do not want water in the lines and I want enough supplied air to the machine to run the machine correctly. Okay, if I have uh, frequent air drops, this can cause hiccups, problems in the edge bander, uh, which is gonna be no good for anyone. Looking down at the incoming air, if I turn this uh, incoming air off, I can then pull my, my catch and filter off and here I'll unscrew my filter to give it a look and make sure that, uh, that everything looks clean. Good, and doesn't need to be replaced. Excellent. One of the other main areas that I wanna hit on, in and around my upper pressure beam and my belt, my drive belt. This area tends to build up chips, shavings, and needs to be blown out. As I can see in this photo, the chips have built all the way up to these rollers, which house bearings. Eventually, these rollers will stop turning, the belt will wear a flat, and I'll lose my bearing and I've got a bunch of maintenance that needs to be done. Not only at the front of the machine, at the end of the machine, this can be blown out as well. A lot of customers ask me, how often should this area be maintained? Well, that depends a lot on how often you run. Is it three shifts, seven days a week? Is it one shift, five days a week? My advice to you is, is to check this after uh, one month of production and gauge how it looks. Uh, if it's still relatively clean, then after two months of production, uh, then I would check and see how it looked after that. So let's dig into that. At would the front this of my- the same? Sorry. No, Seth. no, go ahead. Would this be the same for a machine that didn't have a pressure belt, but pressure rollers? No, this would not. Nope, this is for a belt driven machine only. Okay. Yep. Thank you, good question. So if I run, if I remove my front panel at the front of the edge bander, 
Couple bolts on the back side, couple bolts on the front side. I can then remove this front cover and I can get in here and I can blow this area out, make sure this stays clean. Okay, not only that, this is a great time to inspect my belt. Okay, any belt wear or damage uh, should be noted if I'm having issues running boards through the machine and they're, they're slipping or they're turning or moving, I should inspect my belt, make sure it's in good condition so that it holds the parts correctly. Now let's move to lubricating the conveyor chain. Another a big common problem that a lot of students bring to my class is uh, the lack of maintenance on the conveyor chain. Now some of these chains are manual, manually lubricated, and some of them are automatically lubricated. The ones that are automatically lubricated are using this uh, central oiler that's going to automatically lubricate this chain for us, which is, which is great. Here's a look at the applicator for my, my conveyor chain. And here you can see I'm down checking the oil level of my oiler on the conveyor chain. Very important not only to check oil levels, uh, to check the applications, the applicators, where I'm actually oiling. Because as we all know, we work in dusty environments, and in these shops, dust can clog and contaminate uh, these ports. They can get plugged. Uh, so if you're, you're seeing an infrequent use of oil, it's something I would advise you to, to check, absolutely. Here's a look at a conveyor chain that uh, I want to point out is in pretty rough condition. If we see the top, the chain curls around and we can see that it's, it's bent up. It's actually corroded. This chain is very stiff. I can identify that the track pads are now starting to teepee in the upper right. Some of you may have seen something like this. This is a tall tell sign that the conveyor track needs to be lubricated. Here's a quick video <clears throat> on one of the worst case scenarios that I personally have seen. Track pads, very teepeed, conveyor chain, uh, very corroded and bound up. And we can actually see that very, very large track pad right there. So at that point in time, that, that chain needs a lot of work. Do not let your machine get to that point, okay? Another look, track pad maintenance. What are the conditions of my track pads? Okay. I want to make sure that these track pads are staying in good condition, they're staying fresh. As these track pads get older, they will slip. They'll start to get uh, very slippery, and they need to be replaced. Please do not space these track pads out. Uh, all the track pads need to stay on the conveyor chain. A look at the upper pressure beam belt. Uh, we were talking about checking the belt for wear, any damage. Uh, these belts do dry out over time, you know, on down the road, six, eight, 10 years down the road, depending on how much you run. These belts will wear out and need to be replaced. So here at the beginning of the machine, the in-feed fence, very, very important check. This is number one maintenance uh, besides the glue pot. This fence has to stay clean, okay? It needs to be checked daily for glue, debris, dings, dents. This is what sets uh, our board as it runs into the edge bander. While we're here, we need operators to understand that they cannot throw boards up onto this fence. If we repeatedly hit this fence, we will knock it back and we'll lose our square. So very, very important spot. Now let's talk about the pre-milling station, the joint trimming station. On machines S500 and greater, here's a look at my pre-milling station and the lubrication of linear guides as seen by these four lubrication spots and the grease that needs to be used. Now I'll talk about this in just a moment. <clears throat> but first let's talk about tooling. As far as tooling with the pre-milling station, if you use the insert style tooling for the pre-mill. Know that you can change these inserts out. You can rotate them. Okay, if, if, if I'm running this certain pre-mill station 
with insert tooling and I'm only running 19 two boards or three quarter inch boards. Note that I can take my top cutter that's not seeing any usage and I can rotate him to the bottom cutter, thus giving me more tool life. I encourage this. You can go longer without tool changes. Get the most out of your tooling. Absolutely, get the most out of your tooling. Do I need any special tooling uh, to make sure those uh, inserts are in the right place? Uh, besides making sure that they're blown out, so that's a really good question. Here you can see this is a Torx wrench, a standard tooling Torx wrench. If I remove the insert, that's one of the most important things as far as tooling goes. You have to make sure the pocket is clean. If the pocket is not clean, I sit this insert on top of dust, debris, the insert then is higher than the subsequent inserts. This is going to cause extra wear, decrease tool life, so on and so forth. Always use the correct a torque wrench. Um, never use an Allen wrench on this particular setup. You'll strip these out. You're looking at a lot of downtime uh, to, get the, to get the screw out. So here I can see the pre-mill station. This is an S500 unit. And I'm going to take the cover off, the bottom adjustment cover for the pre-milling station. And I'm basically going to blow this out. Why? Uh, there's hard stops that this pre-milling unit hits on. Those hard stops determine how far my motors uh, engage in to cut. Very similar to the machine smaller than an S500, and we'll see that in a second. So I blow this area out, making sure it's clean. And here I can identify my lubrication ports on the front alongside my air unit. Always making sure this is a four bar unit making sure air remains consistent in this unit and the unit is free of dust and debris. Now on machines smaller than S500, here I'm looking below the pre-milling unit at the pre-mill height adjustment chain. Not often will this uh, height adjustment get moved, so this chain will not get rotated uh, frequently, but <clears throat> we need to oil this chain just to make sure that it doesn't rust. Look at the hard stops on a machine smaller than an S500. These are the pre-mill hard stop adjustments. I can see those over on the left identified by these two nuts. As the cylinder actuates in and out, I hit on these nuts. And this is an important area that I need to keep clean. Any debris will cause my, my cylinder not to fully stroke, my motor not to go all the way in, thus not giving me a straight cut and I will see that in my glue line. So very, very important for this area to stay clean. This video is an extreme circumstance situation. As I can see, this technician is pulling out dust and debris from behind a pre-mill station. Now I want to note, this is very similar to a glue pot unit. If this station cannot move into position, how do we expect it to perform its job? So with all this dust and debris, the customer was not getting a correct cut. Okay, so cleanliness is very, very important. Next, we'll talk about the magazine a little bit. So here's a quick melt unit. Uh, I can clean underneath the quick melt unit with this, this flap here. I always want to make sure I disconnect the glue level probe anytime I'm cleaning this area. I want you to stay safe and glue burns are the number one way to get hurt on edge banders. So I need to unhook the glue level probe so that when I have this swung out or anytime I'm working underneath a quick melt, I don't get hot glue uh, forced down upon my arms, hands, or working area. Very, very important. Here's two glue pots. Uh, the one on the left has been used and not maintained, obviously. And the one on the right is a rebuilt glue pot. So I'll take a moment to talk about our rebuild services. We currently offer glue pot rebuilds. So we can take uh, your glue pot that may look like the one on the left, uh, which is a QA34. We can do the newer glue pots, we can do the smaller glue pots, and we will rebuild these glue pots. So you send them over to us. Uh, we can tear them apart, 
and we can send them back to you. A very, very fast turnaround. Glue pot maintenance, besides cleanliness, which we'll talk about here in a second, the number one thing to maintain is the glue level probe. This probe is responsible for sending a signal to our quick melt to fill the glue pot. This probe located up here at 4.1 is a Teflon style probe. It goes down into the glue pot and senses how much glue is in the pot. To pull this probe and clean it, we first wanna make sure that our glue is warm enough to pull the probe. Okay, I do not want it at full temperature and I do not want it cold. If I have uh, resistance pulling this probe out, I can damage the probe. Never pull by the cord, always by the probe itself. Once I pull this probe out using gloves, I can then let it cool and roll the glue off the end of the probe. This will extend the life of this probe greatly. Once you, once you char glue, once it gets black and chars onto this probe, it's very, very hard to recover and will eventually cause uh, probe failure. So with this sensor, I would recommend at least once a month you're checking this, depending on usage, depending on how often you run. In the next slide, we can see this is a customer's probe, uh, very poor maintenance. Uh, we can see that it's, it's burnt uh, a char around the probe and a little bit of glue. Luckily, this probe was still working. Uh, it wasn't long for this world. It needed to be cleaned, it needed to be replaced. Frankly, the customer got it replaced after this photo, but it needs to be maintained. It'll never get to this point if proper maintenance is performed. Let's take a look at a glue pot. All of our glue pots host a glue pot shoe. This shoe right here, responsible for coming in contact with my workpiece, my board. This shoe will set the spacing in between my roller and board. And it's very, very important that this area right here, the shoe stays clean. Okay, anytime I have a glue spill and I get glue running down around my glue pot, in and around my pan, I wanna try and clean it up as soon as possible. If you do it quickly, you can negate the damage a little bit. If you wait and it burns on, it's gonna be very hard to remove. If I lift my glue pot out, I can see this mating housing underneath. This area right here needs to stay very clean. We can see in this photo, there's been a glue spill. The glue pot sits on this area and for it to sit flat, flush and aligned, I don't need any glue underneath this area. Even on smaller machines, here I can see same mating housing, glue pot release handle, always being very careful of this handle. I do not want to over torque this, I can shear the handle off, uh, not fun. Underneath I can see the drive for the glue pot and the chain that will need to be lubricated. Anytime I'm cleaning this area out, I have downtime. I can get down inside of here, I make sure this chain is oiled, make sure that it's maintained. Here I can see a combination unit underneath the magazine, powering glue pot, pressure roller, and in-feed roller. And here I can see my chain outlined in red anytime I'm down here. Always wanna make sure this area is blown out. Uh, dust tends to collect in this area. So it never hurts to pull the cover and blow this area out, oil my chain while I'm at it. Anytime I'm working with chains, I'm always checking to see the tension a loose chain can lead to a worn chain, which can lead to a worn sprocket. Anytime I have that, I don't replace just the chain, I replace the sprocket as well. Here I can see a three disc coupler. This is an aluminum piece. It goes underneath the glue pot and in feed roller. And what this is going to do is allow those to spin and move at the same time. Driven by a chain at the bottom, which needs oiled. This piece here, anytime I have this unit apart, I make sure to throw a dab of grease in and around these bearings. As failure occurs, it will wear a divot into this piece and you'll actually notice uh, the roller start to wiggle and bounce around. Uh, 
So if you have an in-feed roller, or you have a glue pot roller that is bouncing, uh, it's basically dancing as it's running, this can be a big issue. Uh, this piece will need to be replaced. Here I can see if I look underneath the magazine, my three disc coupler and my power chain. Also on the magazine, I wanna check my in-feed rollers, my rubber roller in particular. I wanna make sure that this isn't worn. I don't have any chunks missing. Uh, if I'm having issues with banding feeding into the machine, this is one of the first places that I'll look. Not only rubber roller, but knurled roller as well. Uh, both rollers, very important to keep an eye on. I'll talk a little bit about guillotine. So the guillotine or the knife that's going to cut our banding, some, some areas to look at. Here I can see my guillotine knife. This knife can be resharpened. When I resharpen it, I actually have two knives. I have a knife, a stationary that sets in the back, and a moving knife in the front, and those work to shear the edge banding. I can resharpen those up to the point of them not uh, lapping over the top of each other, but I do have options as far as that's concerned. Here I can see brass guides that this guillotine will slide in. This guillotine should not wiggle. It should stay uh, relatively stiff inside of here and slide back and forth in these brass guides. I also have these beveled washers behind here and as the guillotine comes in, that's what absorbs the shock. So if I start to notice these bolts here are shearing off, coming loose, I always wanna make sure to check these beveled washers. Okay, more than likely they're broken, missing, the impact is too much and you're shearing bolts off. Here I can see the three disc coupler down here, in feed roller here, and I have a small spring that is the give for this unit as the guillotine uh, fires the spring is what uh, rebounds the guillotine as the board runs through. Pressure rollers. Not only are the pressure rollers to apply pressure to the, to the board edge and the banding, but I'm also cooling down the board edge as well. So I always wanna make sure these are clean, never using any sort of metal, no putty knife, uh, no, no pocket knife. I always wanna use something plastic. Fingernails work great. Uh, checking the pistons, these air pistons, checking to make sure everything moves well and the rollers spin freely. Sorry, um, I have a question. Sure. What if I'm using P wire and I I got some glue uh, stuck in the in the rollers. How how can I clean that? That's a really good question. So anytime I'm using P U R, I first and foremost want to clean it as soon as possible, right? Because P U R will set up, and once it sets up, it is very very tough to get off. Now. If it, is, if it is locked on and I cannot scrape it off, I'm unable to scrape it off, then I'm gonna to have to replace the roller. But as long as I catch it early enough, these brass scrapers that we can see in this slide right here should be enough to get the PUR off as long as it hasn't been run, sat, and, and dried overnight. Once again, PUR cures with humidity, so the longer I let that cure, the harder it's going to get. PUR does not reactivate either. Once it's on, it's on. Excellent question, thank you. Here you can see I'm spinning these uh, pressure rollers, just making sure they're all turning, making sure they're nice and clean. My main pressure roller as well. And then I'm checking these brass scrapers to make sure that the pressure rollers uh, are getting cleaned. Moving down to end trim units. Here I'm just blowing off an end trim making sure all these areas stay nice and clean. I've got a lubrication port there for my THK rails. And then anytime I'm in here around this unit, I'm gonna reach in, I'm gonna grab onto one of these end trims. I'm gonna kind of shake it around a little bit, just make sure everything's staying nice and tight around this area. At the top of this unit, I can also see that I have a proc switch, which is the return switch for my end trim unit. Very important that this switch stays in working position and is not damaged. I can usually find most of my end trim alarms and errors uh, due to switches not being made. 
As far as air valves go, I always encourage to bypass the air valves, make sure that the functions are working correctly. And in this video, we can see that I'm bypassing uh, the chamfering functions on my end trims. I wanna make sure that those end trims chamfer correctly and that there are no dust and debris that gets lodged in these areas. It's common that a lot of times dust can fall down into these areas. The end trim will no longer be able to position itself in a full chamfer position, resulting in a short chamfer. So always making sure to blow this area out really, really well. Shock absorbers on my PK25 unit. It's a very common unit seen on the S500 edge banders, our larger edge banders. Uh, there are shock absorbers uh, located at 6-1. Shock absorbers are really hard to judge. A lot of, of, a lot of students ask me, how do I know what a shock absorber feels like? It's, it's very difficult. What I wanna do is I wanna have some shock absorbers on hand. That's the best way to feel. Protect yourself, get a couple on hand so you can replace them. And that way you can be the judge on when to replace the shock absorbers. Here you can see I'm blowing off this PK25 unit. I wanna make note that I am blowing off both motors. Inside these areas here, we have hard stops just like the pre-mill area. And these hard stops are prone to dust and debris getting lodged in these areas. And my end trim will no longer uh, set itself to perhaps an overhang position or a chamfering position. So I always wanna make sure I'm blowing off really, really well in these areas. This particular unit, the PK25, does have an automatic oiler system on it. Located on the top right, this oiler, if it runs out, will throw an alarm. Um, so so uh, remember that if you do see an end trim alarm, uh, this oiler area uh, would be the first place that I look. Uh, and if it's full, then I would look at the proc switch behind it. Just process of elimination. Once I've checked my oiler, I do have all of my air settings on the front. So this is going to tell me what each one of these air settings needs to be set at. Once I have checked those air settings, I can then look in and behind the entry unit itself. So I've got my side chamfering plate here. I've got my roller, which is a wearable item. I would encourage everyone to have a replacement roller here on hand. I'm also going to check my tooling. Is my tooling sharp? Uh, is my tooling on correctly? Uh, some customers uh, elect to resharpen these end trim blades. Just remember, you only have so many sharpenings before you are unable to cut all the way through the edge banding. Next, we're gonna move down to our trimming stations. And here we're looking at a fine trimming station. In the beginning of the video, you could see I was checking the servo unit to make sure that the servo is uh, free of dust and debris. Uh, very, very important anytime I'm in and around this area. I do not want my servos to run into uh, chunks of banding. I also want to check up and behind this unit. I want to check at my copy wheels, making sure those are clean. Remember, I cannot cut correctly if my copy wheels uh, have glue or are damaged. Another thing to note is to check the bearings in these copy wheels as those can wear out as well. Anytime I see red, marked in red, especially from factory, our technicians will mark using techniques such as this. Anytime I see this, I do not want to touch this adjustment. That's telling me that this is set where it needs to be set. I do not want to move it. Otherwise, I risk my station being out of adjustment and issues down the road. Here I'm looking at a larger S500 machine, a fine trim unit, fully servoed. And you can see as I blow it out, I'm then gonna reach in and I'm gonna disconnect my incoming air. This air is leading to our flex tooling, the multi-radius uh, tooling head for this unit. What I would encourage you to do would be to 
check your entire edge banding machine, not only this area, but check it uh, at times when maybe you have other machinery shut down in the factory. A lot of the times it's hard to hear air leaks and such when you have a lot of different machines running. In particular, I have seen a leak in one of these airlines which did cause radius issues on this particular station. Uh, it was very, very hard to hear the air leak until we had powered uh, other machines down, but it's just something to keep in mind. So once I disconnect these quick disconnects, now note that I had already loosened these nuts. Okay, I don't, I don't want anybody to think that they should be this loose. They should be tight. Note, not overly tight. Okay, this is an aluminum block underneath here and those studs will pull out of that aluminum block. So please do not wrench those nuts down. They just need to be nice and snug. Seth, what Question? other um, safety precautions uh, should we um, take into account before doing all this, uh, this maintenance and putting our hands close to the tooling? Absolutely. So anytime I'm reaching inside of the edge bander like this, doors need to be open. Doors should not be bypassed. Absolutely should not be bypassed. Okay, if my doors are open, then the station itself cannot run. Okay, so anytime I'm, I'm reaching in or around or on a tool, close to a tool, I need to have gloves on as well. And that means I need to have had control power off before so I can open the doors, correct? Ab absolutely, correct. Absolutely. So once I pull this unit out, note these mating pieces right here. This particular piece needs to stay very clean. This is an aluminum housing. This is an aluminum housing. Be very careful that this does not get dent or damaged. If this gets dented or damaged at all, this motor won't sit in correctly and you will not cut correctly. If there's dust or debris on it, same result. So as I pull this motor out of the machine, I set it on something nice and soft. Here I can see my flex tooling. I have two radiuses on this one cutter. And in and around this area, I'm gonna make sure this area stays nice and blown out. I do not want this thing to hesitate. I want it to be able to functionally move in and out easily and do its job. So definitely an area to keep in mind. Anytime I'm cleaning the machine out, I'm reaching over, I'm making sure I blow out this uh, flex trim head if it's equipped on my machine. A prime example of a trimming station, uh, not too long after a running material. A prime example also of, of issues that can arise. I get dust and debris around these copy wheels and I will not cut correctly. And usually you see the result you see on your board is a little bump on the edge because the copy wheel had to go over that chip on the, on the board and then it copies it. Absolutely. It you don't get a good quality on the cutting. Absolutely. That's very well said. A lot of customers don't see this issue because I have stations further down the line that process the board. So they could have a station such as this have a large glob of glue on it. I'm leaving a hump every so often. However, I've got another station after this that's cleaning it up. So I don't see that. However, what I would see is decreased tool life on that station because I'm leaving more material here. So very good. Here I can see the days uh, before dust collection. This is uh, an exaggerated problem. This would be a very big issue. A dust in and around my copy wheels, not only that, dust getting into my motors is a very big issue just for a simple fact of motor life, motor longevity. Here we're down at the corner rounding station. So here you can see I'm pulling main power I'm also going to pull off a, a series of switches here on this particular corner rounding station. This is the MF50 station. This is a two motor corner rounder that operates on magnetic linear guides. A very precise corner rounding station. So once I get these pulled off, I'm then gonna pull the power for my servo motor. 
From there, I can back off my loosening knob and I can pull the corner rounding unit completely out of the edge bander. Always making sure that I sit it on something nice and soft, that I don't damage any of the tooling. And then from here, I want to check and make sure my side tracing ring is as clean as possible. Just like Lucia said, if anything gets on this area, I'm going to trace incorrectly on the board, this being my side tracing plate. Then I'm going to look at my, the condition of my tooling. Is it chipped? Is it damaged? Is it worn or missing? I'll check to make sure that my tracing roller uh, rotates freely. This roller, if stuck, can wear a flat spot in, which can lead to issues. And I want to make sure that the component itself clicks back and forth from side to side. Very, very important. If this, if this clicking does not occur, then the tracing is not correct, which will lead to an improper corner rounded edge. On the S500 FF32, this is a four motor corner rounder. I do have some lubrication points on this particular corner rounder. Here I can see, reaching in, uh, both to blame for most errors on the corner rounding unit. You can see I'm checking the side tracing plate as well in my tooling and roller. There's also a rubber bushing right here that will need to be replaced. This is a wearable item. I suggest you have it on hand. Looking underneath, I can see lots of debris. Uh, this is a pretty common sight. I can see some trimmings from edge bandings that could prevent this unit from fully swinging down. I can see some debris underneath my cylinder here, which can cause issues with it stroking. I can also see in the background this large spring, which is also a wearable item on this cylinder. Making sure I have one of these on hand as well. Here I can see there are a series of shocks and I lift the front top motor up. I can see that there's a shock hidden up behind as well. So always keeping these shocks on hand. Profile scraper maintenance. Let's look at some of the areas of the profile scraper. I've got a side copy. I've got a bottom copy or a top copy if I'm looking at the top and I've got my tool. Here you can see I'm going to uh, remove this scraper head out. I'm going to push, twist, and slowly wiggle until I can freely pull the scraper head out. Once I get it out, I want to inspect the mating surface. I don't want any damage, any dings, uh, any rough spots. Uh, these will wear over time. It is aluminum. So I ask that you take very good care of this area. If I flip the scraper over, I first and foremost want to check these copy wheels. I want to make sure they, they rotate freely. Uh, if they're stuck, once again, you can wear a flat spot into the copy wheel, uh, which is going to cost you as far as a copy wheel replacement. So once I've checked the copy wheels, the bearings look good and I'm unstuck, I want to check my tooling, make sure it's sharp, and I want to check, sure, I want to check this air blow off right here. So I want to make sure this air hole is not plugged or clogged, I wanna make sure it's freely blowing air. Now with the scraper head out, I can blow this scraper head. When, when I change that uh, knife, um, how do I make sure I'm putting it in the right uh, position? That's a very good question. So on the insert, uh, a lot of operators have asked me, is there is there any way to tell which way the insert goes in given the writing on the insert? And that is no. Some inserts will have writing on the leading edge and some inserts will have writing on the following edge. So if I hold an insert up and look at it from the side, I can see that my leading edge is taller than my trailing edge or my following edge. So I always want the leading edge, the taller edge, going towards the material that will be scraped. Otherwise, I'm essentially uh, rubbing the material and I'm not going to scrape at all. If 
that answers your question. So yes, there is there is a correct way to put the the scraper inserts in, and that is with the leading edge, which is going to appear and be taller than the trailing edge on the insert. As far as a glue scraper goes, uh, here's a glue scraper, always making sure that my blowing nozzles are blowing directly on the insert. Not only are they to remove chips, but they're to cool the insert as well. So I, anytime I'm in here, I wanna check uh, the area to make sure it's in good condition. On this particular unit, we're looking at a flat scraper for an S500 series machine. With the beam raised to 60 millimeters, I'm able to pull the dust collection hood off. I get that in and out of the way, and then I can reach in and I can check this tracing shoe. This is what's gonna hit on my board edge. So I don't wanna see any buildup, I don't wanna see any damage, and I can also feel that leading edge of the flat scraper as well. Now on some of these particular units, I have multiple edges uh, per insert. So always good to know, get the most out of your tool life. If my machine is equipped with post heaters at the end of the machine, maintenance is pretty simple. I wanna use a vacuum to suck the air opening of the post heater seen in this video. Anytime I'm at the back of the machine, my incoming air, always very important. My oiler down here at the bottom, always important to keep uh, filled. And then here is my air opening on my post heater, which should be sucked out. Anytime I'm working in and around this area, cleaning this area, very important. These heaters get very, very hot. There is a temperature dial on the side of it, one to 10. I will warn you that 10 is very, very hot. If you have any debris in and around this area, you will melt it. Uh, any wood particles or shavings may set fire, so please keep this area very clean. As far as the buffing wheels go, uh, anytime I inspect the buffing wheel, I'm making sure that I, number one, don't have any glue in my buffing wheel. If my machine is equipped with a flat scraping unit, as we can see in this video here to the left, it should be removing any residual glue on the tops or bottoms of my boards. So if I see glue on my buffing wheel, that's an instant sign that my flat scrapers are not adjusted correctly. I need to look at my flat scrapers, make sure they're removing the glue. My buffers should stay free and clean of glue because if I get glue in these buffing wheels, I essentially create a glue smearing device. Now, as far as options on these wheels, I can flip them. I can take bottom to top, top to bottom. I can flip this one this way, flip that one the other way. I also have a series of adjustments at the tops of the buffers. I can move them in. If you prefer to have the buffing wheels aligned with the board edge, you can do that as well. And there are buffing attachment options. If I wanted to run, for example, a, a Brillo type pad, a wheel for veneers or a sanding type wheel for a veneers or solid woods, I could do that as well. Is, is there a way to clean those um, buffing pads if they get dirty with glue? Yeah, absolutely, you could. You can clean those wheels. Uh, I would recommend trying to use a, a citrus cleaner. Um, I would be very careful with acetone or anything like that, but I would use a citrus cleaner. I would let the wheel soak. I would scrub it, uh, absolutely scrub it as hard as I could and make sure that the wheel uh, dries all the way out before I put the wheel back on. Absolutely, try and recondition the wheels, get the most out of your wheels as possible. Very good question. Two handy tools that I wanna to talk about uh, that I never leave the shop without. Number one, Acmo spray. This is an industrial uh, cooking spray, essentially. This is a, an anti-stick spray that I want to make sure I've got on hand because some key areas I can hit with it are the infeed fence where glue always seems to appear. Uh, pressure rollers is another big area to use as Acmos. Any copy wheels or areas that might attract uh, glue or anything like that. I do warn you, if you run veneers, be very careful. Do not use uh, any sprays like this if uh, you're worried about absorbing into the veneered wood. 
or indium melamine uh, if you're running plywood or anything like that. The second item that I would recommend to have on hand is the Styles glue scraper. Uh, we make this scraper. It works really, really well. Uh, we often use it, the technicians use it to scrape down glue pots. Uh, it's good to get into areas uh, and give things a scrape, pressure wheels, uh, copy wheels, uh, glue pots, things of that sort. So to conclude this webinar, uh, I, I wanted to list out our edge product specialists for each region, uh, Great Lakes, uh, Marty Jones, Northeast Jeff Tolbert, Southeast Dave Schmidt, South Central Dylan McNally, uh, West Lucia Morales. So, so there are your specialists for each one of your regions. If you have any questions, absolutely feel free to email them. And if you inquire about any education from Styles, we offer a lot of different courses. We offer classes on CNCs, to wood WAP, to uh, diagnostics classes, uh, PLC classes, saws, banders, so on and so forth. But, so don't hesitate. We carry a course schedule online on the website that you can find. And I really appreciate everyone uh, coming to the webinar today and letting me speak.